Hi, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. In today's video, we're going to learn about credit and we'll learn about what credit derivatives are. Welcome back to my channel. Today's video is mostly about credit derivatives, but we're firstly going to start out by defining what we mean by credit. This is the first video I'm doing in a series on credit derivatives. I will put them all together as a playlist, which you can watch by clicking on my profile and then on playlists. Hopefully you'll find them useful. All of these videos are based on my book, Trading and Pricing Financial Derivatives, which I've linked to in the description below. Okay, so firstly, what is credit? Credit is the trust that allows one party to obtain goods or resources from another party, where that second party does not pay immediately, but instead arranges to either pay or return those resources at a later date. Credit encompasses any form of deferred payment. Examples include home mortgages, credit card debts, corporate borrowing, and government borrowing. The concept of credit is necessary whenever something is borrowed or lent. Credit risk, then, is the risk that a deferred payment agreement may be reneged on at or before the scheduled payment. This is the risk of default, and credit risk is also known as default risk or counterparty risk. Historically, debt obligations were entered into and the counterparties to the transaction did not change throughout the life of the loan until the debt matured. Credit risk is most thoroughly examined at the initiation of the loan and then monitored periodically until maturity. Loans and bonds can however be traded throughout their lives between a variety of market participants. Thus the concept of credit risk expands to bring in credit deterioration or credit improvement and not just the binary outcomes of borrower repays or borrower defaults. Considerable sums of money can be made and lost by traders through these more subtle variations in credit quality and pricing throughout the life of a bond. Credit risk is better defined as the risk of gains or losses arising from changes in credit quality. Credit rating agencies exist to provide investors an independent measure of the credit quality of issuing firms and the individual debt instruments. The largest credit rating agencies are S&P, Moody's, and Fitch. These companies are paid a fee by the debt issuing entity to provide an independent credit rating, which is then shared widely with public debt market participants. I might do a separate video on credit rating agencies at some point. Let me know in the comments section if you'd be interested in seeing that. Credit ratings can have a tremendous impact on the price of financial instruments. Prior to the existence of rating agencies, investors had difficulty obtaining and processing sufficient information about creditworthiness to make informed credit risk decisions. Unlike the equities market, where typically a company would have only one equity security outstanding, in public markets a company could have a wide range of debt instruments outstanding, each with different maturities, different coupons, varying legal covenants, ranges of collateralization, and seniority of repayment in the event of default. The fact that each issue was rated separately reduced the confusion surrounding these instruments and greatly increased the attractiveness to investors of investing in bonds, including small investors who previously would have found this research effort prohibitive. Ratings information greatly enhanced liquidity in bond markets. Historically, banks made loans and mortgages to companies and individuals and typically held that risk until the maturity of the loan. They funded this with their own client deposits. This introduced a series of limitations on the loan and mortgage markets. A given bank might aim to have a diversified set of outstanding loans to companies. Loaning to a portfolio of companies across industry sectors and applying strict percentage caps on loans to individual sectors should minimize losses in the event of a significant downturn in one industry sector. The bank might mandate a maximum 10% of its loan portfolio to mining companies for 
example, and insist that these amounts be spread across a number of different companies to reduce the default risk of exposure to one company. These sector loan restrictions, designed to make the bank's portfolio safer from defaults, would have reduced loan availability to individual companies. The former hold to maturity loan model constrained the bank's portfolio composition. The bank would only be able to make limited numbers and sizes of loans to companies that they otherwise might be very confident of lending more funds to. Companies received fewer loans under this model due to the bank's constraints. A further drawback was the fact that a bank might have an industry or regional expertise that it could profitably and successfully pursue, but would be restrained by industry sector weight constraints in the portfolio. The bank might have a top-tier mining industry team, one that measures mining credit risk with acute precision and has extensive local relationships with the mining community. This proficiency could not be used to its full capacity in the whole to maturity loan environment. At the same time, there were other investors in the broader financial world who were interested in taking on these credit risk exposures. A similar effect was seen in bank lending for home mortgages, credit cards and student loans markets. This mismatch of banks' ability to underwrite a far greater number of loans than they could feasibly hold, combined with a broader investor appetite to hold credit risk, helped to drive the credit derivatives market. So, what are credit derivatives? Credit derivatives are financial instruments that have payoffs that depend on corporate or sovereign bonds or on loan portfolios as the underlying instruments. They transfer the credit risk from one party to another without transferring ownership of the underlying securities. The underlying securities need not be owned by either party in the transaction. The most common types of credit derivative are asset-backed securities, credit default swaps and collateralized debt obligations. I'll do individual videos on each of these credit derivatives over the next few days. Securitization was developed to ameliorate the problem of banks' ability to issue larger amounts of credit than they could hold to maturity on their own balance sheets. Securitization is the process of creating securities whose value and income payments are derived from and collateralized by a specified pool of underlying assets. What were the effects of securitization? Well, securitization brought about numerous changes in debt markets. It allowed originators to remove loan assets from their balance sheets, which increased overall lending much faster than deposit growth alone would have. Banks competed for loan, mortgage, credit card and bond origination business, leading to decreased borrowing costs for companies and individuals. The increased availability of credit affects demand for and thus the price of real estate and other assets that can be purchased on credit. When a bank made a loan and kept that loan on its books, the credit risk of the loan mattered to the long-term profitability and survival of the bank. Securitization allows financial institutions to make loans that they do not intend to keep on their books. When loans are made in this manner, there is less of an incentive to accurately measure and monitor credit risk. Originators are instead incentivized to minimize the costs associated with qualifying the borrower and monitoring their credit risk. This can lead to a decrease in overall credit quality. Well, that's it for now. Over the next few days, I will put up videos on some of the biggest credit derivatives and I will assemble them all in a playlist. At the end, I'll put up a video about the pros and cons of these products and how they've changed the world. We'll talk about the role of credit derivatives in the credit crunch too. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe if you'd like to see more of my videos. Hit the bell button if you want to be notified every time I release a new video. I'll shortly move to a schedule of releasing videos once a week. If there's a topic you'd be interested in hearing about, let me know in the comments section below. Have a great day. Bye.